All right, guys, a quick little video here for uh, Statistical Inference 4, where we're looking at the Wald test, the Likelihood Ratio test, and the Score test. And as you can see, I've kept this quite simple. Uh, I haven't gone into too much detail. I just want to give you the overarching uh, idea here. So, uh, we're going to get skip straight into it and look at a visualization of what these three tests are actually looking at. But before we do, let's just appreciate the hypothesis that we might be testing here. Say we're assessing a particular parameter theta, and the null hypothesis is setting that equal to some um, nominal value, say theta zero. Uh, this could in fact be zero, the whole thing here, uh, but I've left it general. So this is just a, a null hypothesis where theta is equal to some uh, null value, theta naught. And this hypothesis test will be, will be attempting to reject that null hypothesis to show that it's non-theta zero. Now, in the previous videos, we've uh, assessed something called a likelihood function, uh, such that if we were to take a sample and find a sample value uh, theta hat, we could get a likelihood function for theta that might look a bit like this, where it's centered around our sampled value. So whatever we got in our sample, that would form the center of this uh, likelihood distribution or the likelihood function um, for theta. But of course, there would be some kind of variance around that. And remember our question in hypothesis testing is how far away is this sample or how extreme is this sample value if our null hypothesis were true. So essentially, in a hypothesis test, we're assessing the extremeness of our sample. And as we're going to find, there's three different ways to assess that extremeness. But before we get there, let's just appreciate that this is, might be a likelihood function. Uh, but for all the reasons mentioned in the previous videos, we often like to log that function to form the log likelihood function. Now, appreciating that it's a one-to-one uh, -one function, the point that maximizes this log likelihood is the same point that maximizes the likelihood function. So that hasn't changed. Nor has our task here assessing how extreme our maximum likelihood estimate, theta hat, is with reference to the null hypothesis. So what's going to happen here is, um, is that we can assess this extremeness in three different ways. We can figure out how far away horizontally this theta hat is from theta naught. In other words, the, the horizontal distance between these two values. We can assess the vertical distance between the maximum likelihood estimate and the point on the log likelihood function where this null value exists. So what's the vertical distance between these two points? And we can also assess the difference in slope. So you can look at the slope at the maximum likelihood estimate, and we know that's going to be zero. And then we can also look at the slope of the point at which the log likelihood function crosses this null value of theta. And in each of these comparisons, the bigger the difference, the more extreme our sample is, right? In other words, the more likely we're going to be to reject the null hypothesis. So let's do this one at a time. So we'll zoom in a little bit. Our first test we're going to look at assesses the horizontal distance between our sample value and what we're testing against, our null hypothesis. And that's called the Wald test. Now the Wald test statistic, you can see on top here we have theta hat minus theta naught. That's that sort of horizontal distance. It's squared, and underneath it, we have this uh, information matrix, um, which, when you're dealing with just a single variable, is just the, the variance, right? Well, the inverse of the in information is the variance. So, this calculated statistic has a chi-squared distribution about it with one degree of freedom. So, when we calculate this, we can then assess on some standardized scale how extreme our sample is. Now, in this example, and uh, indeed in all the examples from this video, 
we'll be dealing with a single parameter being estimated. So that's why we only have one degree of freedom here for our chi squared uh, statistic. If you're testing multiple parameters at once, say p parameters, then you will have a chi squared stat here with p degrees of freedom. But for the rest of this video, keep in mind that when I say there's a one degree of freedom here, I'm referring only to the situation where you're testing just one parameter. So it's somewhat simple just to sort of sub in these values that you get from your sample. I mean, you're going to have a sample estimate, right? And you're also going to have a null hypothesized value. Notice here that the uh, information here is to do with the null hypothesized value. Or in other words, it's the information under the null hypothesis. And sometimes that's actually uh, more difficult to assess. So what we can do is we can approximate it by using what's called the estimated information, which is exactly the same thing. You'll see that nothing's changed here, except that we're using um, our sample value here in the information, as opposed to uh, the hypothesized value. Now in doing this, we get a very similar um, statistic here, a Wald test statistic. Uh, and it's now technically called the approximate Wald test. But as with most things, uh, as the number of observations increases, all these small differences kind of come out in the wash. So for large samples, you're more than welcome to use this instead. Now the good thing about the Wald test is that we can actually simplify this even further. And for those that are familiar with the chi-squared distribution, you'll know that that's literally just a z-distribution or a standardized normal distribution that's been squared. So technically what we can do is we can kind of take the square root of this whole beast here. And this is something that you might find quite familiar. This is now a um, standardized difference between the samples value and the null hypothesis value. And all we've done is taken the square root of everything, and this is distributed as a normal distribution. And we've seen this so many times in statistics. You take the sample value, you subtract what we're testing against, and divide by the standard deviation. And when you're dealing just with one variable, the square root of the inverse information matrix uh, is the standard deviation. So again, you can use this to assess how extreme our sample is given the null hypothesis is true. So in some ways assessing whether we should reject that null hypothesis. Okay, now the second test we're going to look at here assesses the vertical distance between the two points. You can see I've put two lines here to indicate the height at the MLE and also the height at um, the null hypothesized value. So these are the two log likelihood values. And it's the vertical distance, which is going to be of interest in our likelihood ratio test. So the distance between these two values, the log likelihood at the sample value minus the log likelihood at the null hypothesis value, so that these two points, if you multiply that by 2, it again will be a chi-squared distribution with 1 degree of freedom. Now, I'm not really deriving this for you here and explaining why it necessarily comes out as a chi-squared. Um, if I have time, I might put uh, a bit more of a derivation, but uh, safe to say you can just use this to find this likelihood ratio test. Now, uh, an obvious question here might be, well, this doesn't look like a ratio at all, and nor does it look like it's likelihoods. These are log likelihoods. So why do we call this a likelihood ratio test? Well, if you appreciate what happens when you log something, particularly logging a ratio, whatever once was division becomes subtraction, right? So this is just a simplified version of a ratio between likelihoods. And look, this just goes along with the idea that logging things makes calculations just a lot easier in this business. So I don't like doing too much hand waving, but for this short video, I'm happy just to do it for the moment, just to say that the log likelihood difference 
is a much uh, more versatile metric to calculate than a um, than the, than the likelihood ratio. So quite simply, you can see here that we just take the heights at these two points or the log likelihoods of the two values of theta here and compare them. We multiply it by two and voila, we have our chi-squared statistic. Okay, and so what's the third test we can do? As I highlighted at the beginning, we can assess the difference in slope for each of these two points. Now the slope at the top will always be zero for the MLE. So you can almost ignore that. Realistically, we're just interested in the slope at this point here, at uh, the point where theta, at the point of the null hypothesized value theta naught. So the score test will have a test statistic that looks a bit like this. Now S is the first differential of the log likelihood. So you get the log likelihood, you differentiate it, and then you put your value of theta naught in there and square it. And you divide it by the information. And you'll notice there's a subtle difference here. It's not the uh, inverse of the information on the bottom. It's actually uh, the inv information straight up. That is uh, distributed like a chi-squared distribution with one degree of freedom. With one degree of freedom. Now, an interesting question you might be asking here or thinking about is why do we need three tests to seemingly do exactly the same thing? Assessing how extreme our sample is, given the null hypothesis. Well, that's a good question. And in reality, there isn't much difference between these tests when you're dealing with large samples. They'll all pretty much converge. So you could use any of those three tests and get the same result. There are subtle differences uh, when the number of observations in your sample is not so great. And I'm not going to go into that here, but um, essentially you could choose your test based on the convenience of what you have available in your sample. One particular advantage of the likelihood ratio test, if you were to re-parameterize what you're testing, you know, like making it theta squared or, um, or something like that, the likelihood ratio test doesn't actually change, whereas the other two do change. So often that's given as the reason why the likelihood ratio test is sort of preferred but all three tests are generally acceptable and valid for the vast majority of situations. So that will do for today. Um, there's additional information in the textbook, which I'll let you go through on your own. But that at least gives you a very handy visualization of what these three tests are doing. Good luck.